Well, thank you, everyone, and welcome to this session on the rise of robo-advice. I think it's, it's already been evident from the sessions we've had so far today from the two keynotes um, in particular that there's a lot of interest in this room and in, um, in New Zealand generally in, in robo-advice. And I think um, there's two particular reasons why the panel we've got today will be, will be really great to hear from. One is um, because we've got Chris, who's the, the founder of you know, what is, I think, Australia's largest and fastest growing robo-advice platform. Um, so he's able to give us that practical insight um, into some of the challenges he's faced in developing that business since 2013, I think, um, since when he founded it. And then also we've got James from, from MB who has been driving the reform process here in New Zealand that's been looking at the, the existing law we've got under the Financial Advisors Act, which is um, not very good from a robo-advice perspective at all. It doesn't allow robo-advice to be given at least personalised advice. Um, so he'll be well placed to speak to some of the questions we've got about the, the existing regulatory environment and, and what we can look, look, to, look forward to seeing under the, um, the new law effectively. So Chris, I thought I'd start with you and, and this sort of comes out of some comments Jesse made in his keynote I think, but um, if you could just talk to us about some of the key challenges you've faced in developing your platform in Australia. Yeah, I think, I mean, this tags on pretty well to what Jesse was saying earlier from, um, from New York, but I think he alluded to the fact that the, the US robo-advice businesses have actually, um, a lot of people in the media suggest they haven't succeeded or they've really started to slow down their growth, but, but in reality they've still been growing very fast and I think the perception that they've started to slow down just comes down to the very high valuations that they've raised capital on recently and what that implies they need to grow to in order to break even. And so, um, for instance, Betterment, which is the biggest robo-advisor in the US, um, they just announced a few weeks ago they're at $8.9 billion of assets under management um, from about $6 billion the year before and $4 billion the year before that. Um, I think most asset managers would be pretty happy at 50% year-on-year growth. Um, compounded for the last four or five years. Um, but the fact is that these businesses have raised capital on valuations of six and seven and eight hundred million dollars. Um, and, and those sorts of valuations um, imply that they need to get to 40, 50, 60 billion dollars of assets before they break even. Um, and, and I think it's only in that context that the, the growth has actually been a bit disappointing. So um, the, the US guys have, have faced the challenges, as Jesse also alluded to, that the big players in the US, especially the discount brokerage business Schwab and Vanguard, which is known for having low cost index funds, have actually come into this space. Um, the, U, the US um, reaction to this has been that, that they're going to sort of take over the space, but the fact that Betterment and Wealthfront and Personal Capital, which were the startups in this space, have still managed to grow quite fast, um, to me shows that it's a, a very big space and actually the big players coming into the area has just um, helped to advertise and raise awareness about the actual category itself, um, which has a positive rub off effect on the smaller players as well, even though naturally Vanguard and Schwab, given their distribution and their existing brands, are obviously gonna win a lot of market share. Um, in Australia, we've had the opposite problem. Uh, we haven't had any big players come into this area. Uh, Westpac did try for a little bit last year. Um, they launched a product, advertised it quite heavily, um, and then pulled out about six months later, um, and then transitioned all of the clients that actually um, uh, signed up for this Westpac product onto a higher fee Westpac product that already existed within their portfolio. Um, so there are players in, in Australia and Asia that have actually looked at this and, and then moved out. Um, from my perspective, being a startup, I would love it if one of the big players actually came into the area because uh, we do a lot of heavy lifting in terms of consumer education and awareness about robo-advice as a category, as, as e uh, in uh, ETFs as an investment vehicle, and, and um, doing all of that costs a lot of money and, and it takes a lot of effort. If we had one of the bigger players helping us do that, um, I'd be happy to give up a bit of market share to, to get more consumers to know about robo-advice. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. That's, um, that's really interesting. James, I might jump to you next. Mm. Um, the, the term robo-advice can mean a lot of things, I think, to a lot of people. And you, you have sort of at one end of the spectrum very basic flowchart type advice and at the other end some very sophisticated algorithms, you know, even getting towards AI in, in future years. Has that been a, a challenge for you in developing the, the regulations and the law that we're going to have in place in New Zealand? It's certainly something we think about, um, I think, as, as policy designers and re regulatory framework designers. I think the best thing we can do is try and make uh, a regulation as sort of tech neutral as possible and as product neutral as possible, really. I think um, you know, regulators can fall into the trap of you know, trying to chase products, so regulate product by product by product, and that's just a, 
a never-ending cycle of, of, of doom for regulators, really, and it ends up in an incredibly prescriptive regime. So the way we're approaching things is to you know, try and keep the act level framework reasonably principled, you know, so core duties that must apply to anyone giving advice, so things like you know, must you know, put your consumer's interests first, that kind of thing. Um, and then sort of have sitting below that maybe some more detail around you know, how some particular kinds of products may work. So that's things like you know, regulations and industry codes of conduct. And, and they're really flexible um, kind, of, kind of tools as well. And of course, you know, FMA um, has quite broad exemption powers. So um, and it's got you know, a pretty clear mandate to um, foster innovation, as we are talking about this morning as well. So I think, you know, I think just to say, basically ensuring that you do have some mechanisms to to allow some flexibility in your regime is, is, is the key to dealing with that. Yeah, that, that might be a good time to touch on that actually. This sort of reasonably recent development is the, the statement from the FMA on Friday that they're going to be looking at ways to allow robo advice under the existing Financial Advisors Act regime and looking at whether they've got the existing sort of exemption powers that will allow them to do that. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you can, you're able to comment on that at all, James. Yeah, but I, mean, I think um, there's probably a few things to talk about on, on the timing here. So obviously we're going through a pretty huge review process right now for the financial advice regime in New Zealand. These things do take um, a bit of time, and particularly when you've got legislation involved, um, you know, there's, there's set processes you have to go through, you know, select committees and, and so forth. So you know, it's going to take a little bit of time to get legislation in place. Um, uh, we've had some pretty strong feedback um, that um, there's lots of institutions and others really keen to launch robo-advice as soon as possible. So. Uh, we're taking on board that feedback and thinking about, you know, is, uh, are there ways we can you know, maybe have that bit of the act come into force early or, or, or something like that. So we're working on that. Um, the other part of the answer here is around, and as you mentioned, Tom, um, FMA has signalled that um, it's going to be doing some consultation next month on its exemption powers. Um, so again, that's, you know, again, that's, that's a really welcome um, step as well. And... Um, I guess we'll have to wait to see what, what's in that um, and go from there. I can probably, like our experience in Australia was that um, like robo-advice, ASIC, our regulator, had never really made a statement on it up until last year. Um, but they had said um, a, about four or five years ago that they were channel ag agnostic when it comes to providing advice and, and they weren't going to discriminate um, based on how advice was provided, whether it was over the phone or over the internet or, or face to face. And so when I was setting up this business in 2013, I'm definitely not a lawyer, but I spent a lot of time reading the legislation to understand how we could actually launch a digital advice um, product and, and business within the context of the existing um, regulatory framework, which we did. Um, so we actually fit in perfectly within the, the traditional financial advice uh, regulatory framework in Australia. We're regulated like a traditional financial advisor. Um, we have to act under best interest duty. Um, we have to provide clients with a statement of advice that explains all of the risks of, of the advice we're providing and the limitations. So, um, yeah, rather than wait for the actual legislation to change, and now ASIC has actually put out some work on this, um, yeah, our view is that um, you know, we could launch something within the framework that existed already. Excellent. Um, we might just cut, cut back to the, the practical side of things, Chris. There was an um, interview with you in the Herald yesterday. You made some observations, I think, about the, the difficulties in finding a banking partner here in New Zealand. And I um, wonder if you could just elaborate on that. And also, any, any comments you've got about certainly um, a lot of the stuff we see, any, any online providers of financial services, um, AML is a real difficult, is a difficult subject for them and a difficult thing to tackle. So if you're just able to comment on that as well. Yeah, sure. So for me, like robo-advice taps into two big opportunities. One is um, generally um, financial services have been a, a pretty clunky industry in, in actually adopting um, technology type distribution. Um, in a lot of other industries, whether it's travel or media um, or retail, they've gone pretty much completely online and consumers can get a great experience online. Um, something I observed from when I was working in financial services is to get access to a financial product or advice. Um, the process was unlike anything people were now used to in, in a sort of technology driven world. Um, part of that is the onboarding process and, and this was one of the big challenges we had when I was setting up the business originally was when I went to speak to different partners and um, when you're a robo-advisor, you do need to use the, the pipes of the industry. So we don't have a banking license or a broking license. We use a bank and we use a broker. Um, but in order to use a bank and a broker, we needed to find uh, one of each that actually had the technical and technology capabilities to allow us to create a completely digital product. And that was surprisingly difficult to do. So in Australia, I spent 
about six months uh, meeting with different brokers to try and see if I could find a single broker that would allow us to have a completely online onboarding process for a, a brokerage client. Um, and in the end, I could only find one in, in Australia at the time that was prepared to do it. I, I even went to my former employer, UBS, which is a, a pretty decent sized business and asked them, you know, are, are you guys prepared to work with us to create a digital onboarding process? And um, it, it, it came back basically back from Switzerland that they weren't prepared to give up on wet signatures. Um, yeah, which to me is a very archaic thing that, you know, there's no, um, in Australia, there's no regulatory reason why you need a wet signature to sign a form anymore. I think that got phased out in 2001, yet there's so many businesses that, because of their processes, they still require that. And, and AML is another one. Um, yeah, a lot of brokers and banks still required a face-to-face -face, um, type AML process or, or to come into a branch to give your ID. Um, I got a credit card recently from ANZ and the whole process was online until the very end where they said now you have to come into a branch and see someone face to face. Um, so I think a lot of the banks are still stuck in this process and when you want to grow a business and scale it very quickly that, that creates a giant friction because consumers just give up at that point. Your dropout rate you, um, is exceptionally high when you tell people that they need to go to a physical <coughs> location to actually um, access uh, what should be a digital product. So. Um, yeah, it took us a long time to get there, but eventually we found um, Macquarie Bank in Australia was prepared to do a completely online onboarding process, and they've been fantastic. Um, we now onboard clients using a Macquarie Bank API, so our, our system basically talks to their system um, on the AML side and, and on the onboarding side. Um, but from what I understand, there's still none of the major banks in Australia that are prepared to offer that as a service to startups. Yeah, I mean, it's quite ironic, really. Like, I applied for a new passport on the weekend, and that was completely online to get a passport. You, you can't do any of the other processes that way. It's, um, yeah, it's a bit of a frustration, I think. The, the next question I've got, really, is the theme for today is, is about uh, disruptive innovation in financial services. And um, perhaps we'll start with you, James. Do you have any views on the, the likely disruptive impact for, of robo-advice on the New Zealand financial advisor market? Yeah, I mean, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? And it's, it's a pretty hard one to answer. Um, I guess you know, the first point to make, and it's pretty trite really, is that you know, this, is gonna, you know, this sector's gonna innovate in you know, ways we've never even thought of today. So um, to some extent, it's, it's hard to predict. But um, having said that, um, I just wanted to pick up on a point that I think Cam just made this morning about you know, the, you know, the great unbanked. Um, you know, so we've been doing this review of financial advice in New Zealand, and you know, one thing we've found is that you know, um, there actually aren't that many financial advisors in New Zealand. I think it's 1,800 AFAs. Um, and they're primarily serving customers with you know, pretty huge chunks of money. So you know, if you've got half a million bucks to invest, a million bucks to invest, you're really, really well served by some, you know, some great AFAs in New Zealand. But you know, for, the, you know, for the rest of us, which is 99% you know, of the country, um, you know, there's actually no you know, really good personalised advice kind of service. So I think there's, there's a real opportunity there to kind of create a new a new market and really help Kiwis have access to advice. And that, that's almost a bit like, you know, the story Uber tells around, um, you know, creating new markets and, and just as a personal experience, you know, I was, I was working late the other night um, on robo-advice. Um, I missed my last express bus. It was a really cold, crappy night in Wellington. Um, you know, I didn't want to catch number two bus. I to go to Kuberni and wrong tire. It's, it's a shocker. So, um, <laughs> you know, in, in, in the old days, you know, I mean, a taxi is just too expensive. You know, I'm like, I can't afford that in a public service salary. But, um, <laughs> but you know, um, um, you know, I thought, like, I'm going to get an Uber, and it's you know, basically half the price. So it's kind of creating that new kind of market, and that's it's not a perfect analogy, but that's you know, one way I think that robo advice can really help to kind of grow, grow that market in New Zealand. Having said that, obviously, um, you know, in certain markets, it is going to put pressure on existing human advisors to really kind of. You know, justify their service, you know, what's, what's your value add, what's, you know, um, you know, you know how can you justify the fee that you're, you're, you're charging. So you know, there will be some disruptive impact for sure. And possibly particularly in you know, non-wealth management kind of, kind of spaces as well. So you know, insurance advice, that kind of thing, where you know, some, products, you know, some products are maybe more fungible. So if you don't mind, there's some great questions coming from the floor. So I might just sort of um, inter interrupt with a couple of them because there's some really good ones. Um, just generally, has robo-advice dumbed down the asset and liability modelling, risk objective and investment solution process? Oh, the question's just disappeared. 
has it dumbed down the asset allocation and investment process? Because it's just really uh, an algorithm telling us where we should all put our money. That's pr yeah, probably one that I can answer. So, like, I, I used to be a fund manager and I used to be a trader and, and something, and I'm going to talk about it in the breakout session actually later on, but one of my big observations from the industry was that over the last 20 or 30 years, we've added a whole lot of extra complexity that actually adds no extra value to the end consumer. And, and if you have a look at the value chain of financial products, you've got the advisor, you've got the platform, and you've got the product, and each one is clipping the ticket, and then you've got the asset consultants and the advisors and all these other people. Um, but in the end, like when it comes to investing, there's risk and there's reward and, and everything else is just marketing in, in my perspective. So um, like that's my philosophy on investing and, and actually helping people get the right financial advice. Uh, unfortunately, the, the industry is so well employed. I mean, in Australia, it employs 10% of our workforce financial services. So I think the real disruption will come over the next 10 years where um, digital products and services can actually disinter disintermediate a lot of these jobs that um, the industry has created the perception that they're needed but they actually aren't and, and we've been operating for three years now and our performance of our portfolios and, and the advice um, are I think a testament to this. We've, we've outperformed many of the big active funds and, and the advice we're giving clients is keeping them invested during times of market volatility where if they were managing their own investments um, or even if they had an advisor, they met, might be um, deciding to do something that was actually um, against their best interest, whether that was over trading or, or buying high cost funds or, or um, chasing returns. So I think um, yeah, the, the skeptics or the, the, a lot of the people in the industry don't like robo advice because they say that it oversimplifies the process. Um, but my, my perspective actually is that the industry has overcomplicated the process and it really should be a lot more simple. I'm going to jump on there as well, and just picking up my previous point as well. Again, you know, you know most Kiwis can't get financial advice; that they have no access to advice. You know, the advice just isn't getting given to them. So, you know, anything that can help you know, help Kiwis get that financial advice, and particularly simple advice, often you know, it's you know, simple advice from the Kiwi Saver or, or other bits of other things like that. Anything that can help them get that kind of advice, I think, is a good thing. It's another sort of misconception, I think, of robot advice that it only targets sort of in, like entry level investors. And it's certainly true that's a new sort of pool of investors that robot advice opens up to. So our minimum investment to get advice is $2,000, or the minimum amount you can invest with us is $2,000, where to see an advisor would often, you know, you'd need a few hundred thousand dollars, if, if not more. But actually, the fastest growing segment for us is actually self managed super funds in Australia. And these are are people that are a bit more sophisticated than that, a bit older and have much bigger balances. And, and the truth is that um, by getting better asset allocation and by reducing the risk in their portfolios, they can get a lot of benefit as well. There's a question here. It's not the most popular one, but I think it's really interesting. Is there any evidence to suggest that robo-advice leads to a better return or, or lower risk? Um, yeah, I mean, there's plenty. Well, so too early. Do we need a, a couple of business cycles to work that out? And that's a legitimate question. No, so I mean, you can compare it to two, the two sort of traditional options. So the traditional option, number one, is to go and see a, a financial advisor and, and get access to a traditional investment product. Um, I think the big advantage of a um, robo solution compared to that is that over the long term, um, the, the biggest impact of going through that channel is the cost. And the cost of an extra 1% or 2% per year may not sound like a lot, but over your lifetime, um, we did a study when we do it every year now in Australia called the Fat Cat Funds Report that looks into all of the fund managers and how much they charge and what impact it actually has over your life. Um, and for the average person, if they're paying an extra 1.5% or 2% on their investments, um, it actually adds up to somewhere between a quarter of a million dollars and half a million dollars over their lifetime. So um, by actually just cutting out that cost, and giving people essentially the same asset allocation, you can definitely improve their results in, in, my, in my view. And I think that's why Vanguard um, you know, took more assets under management last year than every other fund manager globally combined. Um, it's because people are realizing that cost is such a big driver of, of, of net returns. There is one, another question that's sort of the one that I have to throw to the panel. Can you please quickly explain what robo-advice is? Can you sort of in, in a Twitter uh, tweet, 140 characters or less. So it, robot advice is, is now sort of broadened to describe a lot of different things, anything that's basically digital advice. But specifically our type of robot advice, which is where it sort of emanated from in the US, is a, a website where people come and put in um, some personal information about their risk capacity, their investment horizon, their cash flow needs, their personal balance sheet. Using that information, we tell you, first of all, should you be investing at all? 
And if the answer is yes, how much you should be investing and what you should be investing in, and then manage those investments for you. So that's what yep. robot is. And there's another question that I think um, is also important. Are there organisations in New Zealand ready to provide robo advice that are being held back by the current regulatory environment? Um, maybe a show of hands in the crowd. <laughs> um, one in the corner. Um, yes, I mean, people, people are talking to us obviously about this, and, and yes. I know FMA as well. So um, that's why I think it's quite important that, you know, that, that, that we sort of get a move on with our, with our regime. And also, it's great that FMA is, is going um, to consult as well on, on helping out. And there's been quite a lot of noise in the media on exactly that yep. point, just to suggest that there is a bunch of people out there you know, sort of ready and waiting to go. We might back, jump, jump back into a couple of the other questions. Please do, yes. Um, James, this is one for you, perhaps, but also be good if you could comment on it. Um, Chris, it, it's a question, and some of the, a lot of the submissions as we've been going through the reform process, people have been commenting on whether there still needs to be a human sitting behind robo advice, you know, either checking the advice as it goes through mm -hmm. or being available to be called if necessary, and just be interested in your views on that and, and where yeah. we've landed. Yeah, I guess the, the robo advice. So it's, it's you know it's not human human based. So you know, I think we're unlikely to mandate that you must have a human with you. But having said that, um, you know, obviously you know, there was some sort of licensing process, and that you know, will involve you know, the robo advisor being able to demonstrate to, to FMA that I guess somebody or, or something is you know, making sure that systems are robust, um, um, that kind of thing. Um, some, some, one thing some people have raised with us is you know. Um, but how about customer service? Won't people want to pick up the phone and talk to an advisor? Again, that, that's probably not something we'd, we'd mandate and, and regulation. I mean, it's something the market can take care of. I'd be interested to hear Chris's experiences with, um, with that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, my personal view is that act, like we're actually providing personal advice to clients. And I don't believe that when you're setting up a business, you can know all of the different possible circumstances that someone can have where your algorithm can capture them all. So um, we basically sign off on each statement of advice that we provide clients with making sure that we feel that it's actually in the client's best interest. And so there is actually a human um, in our business signing off on each um, client's investment agreement and, and the advice we're providing to them. And, and the reason for that is I believe until you've seen thousands and tens of, we've already had tens of thousands of people come through our process, but until you see that many scenarios, you really can't think of all the different combinations of, of different personal circumstances. And, and we uh, still today see things that we, we've never seen before where we have to go back to clients and ask for them to clarify information or provide more information. So I think uh, eventually we will be able to automate 99.9% .9 of cases, but we're not even quite to that point yet. And I don't think it's prudent to, to be doing that from the start, I mean, regardless of what the regulatory sort of in, uh, regulatory yeah, rules are. Tom, you've got more questions there? Yeah, I've got a, a couple more, but if you've got some, you can... Oh, oh yes, I'll, I'll, there's, there's plenty here, so we're happy just to sort of switch between uh, who's asking the questions. Um, there's a question here, and it's sort of... It's an important one, I think, because I'm hearing this discussion go back and forth because it's really interesting to me. Do you think that mass robo advice will become self-fulfilling? Because if everybody's, for everybody's in the same category, you're advising the same risk profile, asset allocation, and these sorts of things. So, is it just going to be compounding perhaps some of the, um, dare I say, it, the herd mentality that occasionally comes with these sorts of things? I mean, this is a, a bit of a myth that's perpetuated by the active funds industry when it comes to indexing as well. So they, they're, they're, I don't know who asked the question. So the, um, I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry. The, I've just got the question. I'm, I'm not sure, sure there's a few active sorry. managers in here. I mean, active managers love to say that indexing is like a self-fulfilling thing and then the market's yeah. getting more, more and more stupid. But there's a couple of arguments that sort of disprove this. Um, first of all, like... Um, act active management is still making up the majority of trading, even though um, passive investing is now a bigger percentage of all the actual a assets under management. But because passive trades a lot less, um, the actual pricing mechanism is still very much driven by active managers. Um, and so it's not like the market's becoming less efficient or more, more stupid because of robo-advice. Um, and in terms of the actual strategies that are being recommended, I mean, these are, these are just uh, sensible long-term investment um, strategies. We're not trying to make short-term market calls or try to, trying to tell clients to get in and out of different asset classes quickly. Um, we take a, a strategic long-term asset allocation approach, um, which, uh, and we tell clients that if you're going to be investing, um, it's not investing if you're just doing it for six months or a year. I mean, that's still really just a flip of the coin. Um, that's speculation. If you're going to be investing, um, you actually have to be thinking about things from a longer, longer time frame. 
And a related question that sort of popped up um, here is to what extent, how often is the robo advice updated? Because of course markets, personal circumstances change virtually daily. So to what extent do you have to go back for new advice every time you know, the Dow's down 400 points this morning or you know, maybe I got a promotion and a pay rise? To what extent does that feed into me needing, if you like, to regularly update my financial advice. So I think the, the perception is that when markets change, that's when we should be changing the advice, but actually that's when the advice shouldn't be changed at all. And, and I think that's what the industry likes people to believe, that they should be watching the news and, and you know, you know the, the Dow was down 370 last night or maybe you should be selling. Actually, our, our process is, is the opposite. Um, we rebalance out of assets that have done well into assets that have underperformed, which is a strategic asset all allocation approach to keep risk consistent over time. But we encourage clients not to pay attention to all of the short-term market noise because um, behavioural biases um, that everyone has will make them probably do the wrong thing then. So the only time we encourage clients to make changes to their strategy is when their actual personal circumstances have changed. So, um, and, and I think that's similar to most good financial advisors. Um, if their investment time frames changed or their cash flow needs have changed or they, that, yeah, they need money at a different point in time, that's when it's appropriate to make a change. But um, you know, not just because one investment's gone up or down. Um, and, and then the rebalancing process is what captures that. And one final question, I think, for the panel, because I've got another one here that's yeah. sort of like related. Sorry, but this is, no this is just uh, like a, it's a, a smorgasbord of uh, questions. Are regulators in New Zealand uh, putting enough resources into supporting robo-advice and other fintech developments? He told you he was staying back late. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> regulators in other countries are further ahead. I suppose that's a, an implied um, criticism. And providing more, more active support to the fintech. So to what extent... Uh, is there enough resources going into this area or is it just getting running or ahead like wildfire and the uh, regulators are slow to catch up? Oh, there's a few answers to that question. Um, we are putting a fair bit of resource into this, um, yeah. bearing in mind that you know, the New Zealand public sector is actually a pretty small, finite resource. You know, I've got a team of 10 people doing a whole range of things, but you know, FinTech's pretty high up in our radar and we're you know, pretty actively involved with the sector. And um, you know, I've got um, um, some of my team here today who um, I've been working with FinTech NZ pretty closely um, uh, on this. I think uh, there might be um, a sandbox question in there. Um, I think it's what people are getting at in terms of other regulators being further ahead. Um, so our, our view on regulatory sandboxes is that um, we're not sure we need one in New Zealand. Uh, it was actually quite interesting. I was at a conference in Australia recently where had regulators from you know, Singapore, Ontario, Australia, and, and ASIC as well talking about their experiences with their regulatory sandboxes. And the interesting thing they said was that you know, when companies are coming into them, it's actually turning out that you know, hardly any of them actually need any kind of sandbox help. What they need is someone to talk to in the regulator um, who can sort of help them and you know, talk through the regulatory regime. And, and actually often the best thing they can get is some sort of more tailored exemption. Um, so in many ways, the sandbox is almost a, a portal into talking to the regulator and actually being a effective thing in itself. Um, and that's something I, I think um, you know, we're, um, we're, we're, we're exploring. You know, how can we do that better? Um, how can we, um, you know, along with FMA and you know, I guess Reserve Bank and other, um, other government agencies, you know, how can we be more open? Um, one of the nice things about New Zealand is actually you know, you know, we are small, so you, know, you can find this pretty easily. You, know, you think you know, ASIC has 2,000 people, you know, FMA has 170 or something. Or, you know, so we're easy to find and we're, um, we're nice, friendly people. You can always come and talk to us.